Napoleon Bonaparte's life was spent immersed in and surrounded by the military, but not everyone wanted to be a soldier in one of his seemingly endless campaigns. So in this episode of Footnoting History, we answer the question, how did one avoid becoming a Napoleonic soldier? Hey everyone, Christine here to talk to you about Napoleon's army. I thought this was a good topic to kick off August because August 15th was Napoleon Bonaparte's birthday and few people love the army like Napoleon loved the army. So happy birthday, Napoleon. Here I am adding another episode to my Revolutionary France series, this time with a talk about the men who were called upon to fight in Napoleon's wars, or even more specifically, the men who did not want to fight in those wars. From the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, through Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815, life in France was a roller coaster. The country overthrew and executed its monarchs, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. A revolutionary government took over, and a period called the Terror occurred, where much of the nobility met their deaths at the guillotine. When that was toppled, there was an attempt at a post-revolutionary government called the Directorate, but that was ended in 1799 with a coup led by Napoleon Bonaparte that made the country a consulate and then an empire. Then Napoleon was overthrown, a monarchy was restored, and Napoleon returned and ruled again until he was defeated at Waterloo and sent it to his final exile. Whew, that is a lot for a country to go through in less than 30 years. I'm exhausted just listing part of it, so you can only imagine what it was like to live through. But the thing is, there were some constants in that period, and if you paid attention to the topic, you can probably guess that one of those was war. During this period, France was involved in almost non-stop military conflicts of one sort or another. With battles to be fought, soldiers were needed in increasing amounts. To fill the ranks, the government summoned the populace, and the people of France became accustomed to the fact that many of its citizens would be required to serve. Since in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, women were not candidates for military service, the duty fell squarely on the shoulders of the men. In 1793, the same year that both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were executed, the revolutionary government, known as the National Convention, needed soldiers. Although the early revolution saw an influx of enthusiastic volunteers, that could not sustain the army forever. They issued what was called the levy en masse to add to the military ranks. Eligible men were defined as being between the ages of 18 and 25, able-bodied, unmarried or widowed without children, and not employed in certain areas like armaments. Ultimately, it contributed to France having over 750,000 soldiers from all levels of society, but it was widely believed to be a one-time thing. Cue the narrator saying it would not be a one-time thing, at least not overall. After the revolutionary government was overthrown, the directorate that followed it approved the Law Jordan in 1798, which was the opposite of a one-time thing. This law organized men into classes based on when they turned 20, so that each year, as a new group hit that age, they became eligible for required service. The class could continue to be called, presumably, only until its men reached the age of 25. So we're talking about a five-year span of worrying about being called up. This law provided the basis for the evolving conscription practices up through the end of Napoleon's reign. There were two ways of being called. You could either be designated for immediate mobilization or put into a reserve contingent. But more often than not, even if you were in a reserve, you would eventually go too. Under Napoleon, the number of people called varied every year based on the military's needs. This ranged from a low of about 60,000 in a year like 1804 up to a call of almost 300,000 in just the month of October in 1813. More men were always needed, and many people resented the relentless calls to arms. There were benefits to being in Napoleon's army. Notions of the glory of success, adventure, a sense of duty to one's country, or hope for advancement might have been enough to draw in some men. But let's face it, 
the men who were being drafted into service were not the same ones who were likely drawn in by these ideas. After all, if they wanted to be soldiers, they could have volunteered. Faced with the likelihood of mandatory service, they contemplated ways to avoid it. Now we are going to examine the paths that thousands of Frenchmen took to stay out of uniform. Let's start with the most basic requirements for soldier life, fitting into the physical standard. In some ways, this is completely out of the candidate's control. He could have dreamed forever about being on the battlefield, but if he didn't fit the physical requirements, he would be barred from service. However, while that might disappoint some, for others, it was a lucky break. One example of the physical requirement was that you had to meet a specific height, though the farther things went on and the more and more soldiers were required, the lower that height became. In addition to being too short, you could be excused for a physical deformity, infirmity, or the somewhat vague, weak constitution. Multitudes of the young French population were able to legally avoid conscription using these reasons. For as long as Napoleon was around and these processes were in place, there were suspicions and accusations abounding about how much was people truly being unfit to serve, having an actual deformity or condition, something like epilepsy, and how much was people fixing the system, either through getting others to lie for them, or in more painful cases, self-inflicted injury. Many families, of course, were more than willing to help their men use these as a loophole to avoid service. But what if you are physically capable? Well, there were some cases where you could ask to be one of the last people called from your class. I'm including these as ways to avoid service, but to be fair, few people would probably want to manipulate their lives so they could qualify for being called last. In order to guarantee that you would get classified to be called after everyone else, you had to fall into one of a few categories that demonstrated the importance of your remaining at home. These included being the only son of a widow, meaning the person that your mother depended on with no recourse for immediate family support, or if you were the elder brother of orphans, that is essentially their father figure and caregiver, or if you were the brother of someone who was already conscripted into service. Don't forget, though, that even if life did throw you into circumstances where you were able to, or more likely needed to, ask to be part of the last call, you might still end up going. You would just defer it as long as possible in order to keep things together at home. But outside of physicality and extenuating circumstances, how did your average person avoid service? Well, first you could find someone else to go in your place. That process was called replacements. But because you had to be able to afford compensating the person going in your stead, not everyone could afford it. You also had to cope with the ever-changing requirements for who the government said could replace you. Some of these requirements came to include that he had to conform to the army's height requirement and come from the same area as you. He also could not be from a class that had not yet been called up. They didn't want you poaching from future groups of conscripts. You were also responsible for your replacement's actions. If he ditched service, you might be called to serve for yourself. So even this, the seemingly most convenient method of avoiding service, paying for someone else to do it, was not without its hitches. But it was still a heavily favored option for those with the finances to shoulder it. Another, smoother option of avoidance included playing a game of chance. Heck, maybe you're someone who loves to gamble, so here was one for you. Substitution. Substitution is simple. You just trade your low, likely to be called draft number with someone else's higher, less likely to be called draft number. And then you hope that they get swept into things and you don't. Or maybe if you do, then it didn't matter in the first place. That's the gamble of it. Of course, you'd have to convince somebody to trade with you, so you could convince somebody to trade with you and then still both get called. Or you could convince somebody to trade with you, and then they get called, and then you get to stay at home. This could go many different ways. As I say, it might not prevent you from going, but much like being part of the last call group, it could help you buy time before you go. Next comes my personal favorite option, marriage. If you could find someone to marry you, 
for much of the period that meant that you were no longer eligible for conscription, as it was often limited to unmarried men. Now, I know there's a common line of thought that everyone in the past married when they were incredibly young, but that's not necessarily the case. In France, at the time of the Revolution and the First Napoleonic Era, it was not the universal norm for men to marry before the age of 20, which was when they could be conscripted. But if you knew you were coming up to the age of possibly being called in the draft, and there was a woman around willing to help you out, proposing was a good option, regardless of her age. I say this because there are numerous cases of 20-year-old men marrying women in their 70s who were often widowed, in order to avoid entering the army, which naturally raised the eyebrows of officials. Those eyebrow-raising officials did try to curtail the marriages happening for this reason, with things like setting a deadline of when you had to be married in order to gain your exemption. Eventually, another caveat was added. You needed to have children in addition to a wife to get to stay home. Still though, wife over warfare? especially in a world where divorce was not necessarily off the table? Not a bad option, but you know, again, not one that everybody had. Because although there were these myriad ways to escape serving, legal methods were not feasible for everybody. Sometimes desperate times called for desperate measures. And times were more likely to be desperate the poorer you were. Because the less money you had, the more your options for avoidance shrank. So our final methods, evasion and desertion, were not ones approved by the government. Evasion means that they chose not to show up when their class was called or they were supposed to report. And it's not unlikely that they had help doing it. Family and friends were known to help men dodge their draft by helping them hide until the perceived danger of conscription passed. Desertion, by contrast, involves the person reporting originally, then either ducking out and running away at some point along the trip from home to the place of service, or abandoning their position once you are actually already serving. The former was more common than the latter, because regrets of answering the call to duty came on quickly, and if you combine that with the delay between reporting and reaching your intended unit, it was a perfect storm for men ditching en route. Both evasion and desertion were rampant in the Napoleonic period. In fact, the sheer number of evasions and desertions contributed to multiple groups of men having to be called up within short spans. Creating soldiers out of men who did not volunteer was a process laden with stress for local administrators with quotas to fill, and there was no limit to the creative actions taken by men who were desperate to avoid life on the battlefield. So I'm going to leave you with this to ponder. If you were a man coming of age in France during the Napoleonic period, how would you handle fixing conscription? And if you didn't want to go to the battlefield, how would you get out of it? If it was me, I'd be hoping someone wanted to marry me. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.